The Thais have borrowed the word mana from Pali. In Pali it means conceit, particularly the conceit that I am, where you establish the sense that you have an identity. But in Thai it's developed other meanings, positive and negative. It basically means pride in Pali. <coughs> Excuse me. Means pride in Thai. The negative meaning in Thai corresponds to the English word conceit, where you simply think you're better than other people. The positive meaning has to do with being determined. You're facing a difficult task. It's going to require a lot out of you. And you stick with it all the way to the end. And there's a kind of pride that goes with that, that enables you to do that. And it's good to think about these two meanings of pride, because they play a role in the practice. In the positive sense, you want to be proud about the fact that you are practicing, you're doing something noble, you're following the customs of noble ones. You're looking for your happiness in a way that's totally harmless. It's going to require a lot out of you. At the same time, you're trying to maintain the customs of the noble ones. In other words, you don't simply practice them yourself, but you're passing them on to others through your example. And John Fuang tells the story when he was, when he was a John, with a John Mun. A John Mun would make his spittoons out of coconut shells. He would carve them himself. And if they broke, he'd carve a new one. Someone came one time with a nice glazed ceramic spittoon. And John Mun refused to accept it. He said, I already have one. And the donor said, Well, this is of higher quality. And John Mun said, What do you mean higher? Where does ceramic come from? It comes from dirt. Whereas coconut shells come from high up in the tree, they're much higher. He was speaking in a manner that the Thais say they call half in jest, half in earnest. But he's making a point that as a monk, as a practitioner, your values are different from those of society at large. And in order to maintain those values, you have to have a certain amount of pride in what you're doing. Otherwise, it's all too easy to give in to people's requests to accept their gifts, make allowances, do things in a more modern or efficient way. And once the god of efficiency comes in and begins to have some power in the practice, the things begin to fall apart. John Fuang would sometimes speak with scorn of the people who want things to be more modern, more up-to-date. As he said, the Dhamma and the Venya are timeless. And we have to have pride in our tradition in order to maintain it. Now, you do have to be careful about that pride. You notice in the Sutta and the Customs of Noble Ones, the Buddha said that you are careful to be frugal and to be content with little. And at the same time, you watch out so that you don't exalt yourself and disparage others over the fact that you are content and they're not content. We're not here to compare ourselves with others. So it's a fine line. Being proud of your tradition, but not making it a reason to look down on others. And John Mahabhava tells us of when he was with the John Mun. He would take on the Tudanga practice during the rains retreat of not accepting food from people who brought food after the alms round. And as the rains retreat wore on, he noticed other monks who had taken the same vow would one by one by one fall prey to the desire to take some of that food that came afterwards. And he's very proud of the fact that even though they fell down, he wouldn't fall down. He said every once in a while, John Mun would come over and bring some food that had been brought afterwards, slip it into John Mahabhu's bowl. He would do it in such a way that he had slipped it in before John Mahabhu knew what had happened. 
John Munn would say, have some pity on these people, they came late. And this is John Mahabha who said, you did it just enough to warn him that, that there's a danger in pride, but not so much or not so often as to discourage him. Because after all, it is a good thing if you realize that you have some defilements around food. You want to be a little bit extra strict with yourself about them. And having this tradition is a good tradition to maintain and a good tradition to keep alive. Not only for its own sake, but also for the sake of reflection, as you're learning how to have some pride in your tradition as a practitioner in areas like food, clothing, shelter. It makes you think about other areas where you're proud, where you've picked up some pride from the culture from which you came. And the question in it is, is this an appropriate pride here in the practice? For example, with our speech, it's very easy to see that there are people out in the world who are afraid to say the truth, or afraid to express their feelings. And so there's a certain amount of pride that comes with the idea, well, I'm not afraid. I'll say whatever I see is true, or whatever I see have come through my mind. And so there's a certain kind of courage or bravery about that. But is it appropriate? After all, we live in a culture of restraint here. And just as John Fuang was scornful of people who were eager to bring things up to date, and John Sawat was scornful of people who, as he said, as soon as something pops in their head, it pops out of their mouth. They don't have any filter. Because you have to think, what you say is a type of karma. You're creating the world around you through your speech. And is your speech a gift to others, or is it simply an expression of what you feel like saying? Because again, think back to the act of maintaining some of the Dodanga practices, maintaining some of the old ways of doing things. We do it not because it makes us better than other people, because it is a gift. As the traditions are maintained, they can be passed on. Other people can benefit from them. So you should have the same attitude to your speech, toward your actions. Are they a gift to others? This is why it's good to have a filter. Something comes into your head, you, it's fallen into the channel going out of your mouth. You should set up some checkpoints. First checkpoint, is this true? The second checkpoint, is this beneficial? Does it really help other people that this particular thought or this particular idea is getting out into the world? And then checkpoint number three, is this the right time and place? So even though this is less efficient than the fast lane, still it does mean that your speech takes on more value. And it's the kind of speech you can be proud of, not because you're unafraid to say what you think, but you're proud because you've tested it, you've considered it and decided that this is a good thought to go out in the world. You treat your speech as if it has value. So ask yourself, when I open my mouth to speak, is it a gift? Or is it simply opening a valve of a of a pipe, who knows what is going to come out the pipe. And as you decide to be more careful in how you speak, more judicious in how you speak, it 
you discover that your speech something becomes something that you, of which you can genuinely be proud, in the positive sense of the word.